Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Transforming Chaplaincy Celebration of Spiritual Care Week and to today's webinar, Spirituality and Mental Health, Empirical Insights and Clinical Directions. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of that same dashboard. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and hope to include them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to introduce Chava Salaji, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Chava. Thank you, Andy. Um, happy Spiritual Care Week uh, to everyone. And thank you for uh, joining us as we celebrate this week. Um, I'm Chava Silaji, the Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. And we have had some really great webinars this week to explore the theme of chaplaincy and mental health. And, um, and you have the QR code and a link on the screen. So um, that will lead you to our Spiritual Care Week webpage where you can uh, see the recording of, of our webinars from this week and resources. Um, also, we are excited to start the Chaplaincy and Mental Health Care Research Network during Spiritual Care Week. And this network connects chaplains, interprofessional colleagues, researchers, and leaders to advance the integration of chaplaincy and mental health care through research and evidence-based practices across uh, the continuum of care. Uh, on the same website that you have the link up for, um, uh, we have also posted discount codes, 40% uh, and 20% discounts for two books on transforming chaplaincy through research, chaplaincy research, and evidence-based practice. And we are grateful to those publishers for making these available uh, for us. Uh, today, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. David Rosemarin. Um, Dr. Rosemarin is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, the director of the Spirituality and Mental Health Program at McLean Hospital, the founder of the Center for Anxiety, which provides services to over 1,000 patients a year at multiple states, in multiple states. Uh, Dr. Rosemarin uh, is an international expert on spirituality and mental health. He has published over 100 manuscripts, editorials, chapters, and served as the co-editor of the Handbook of Spirituality, Religion, and Mental Health. Uh, his work has been also featured in Scientific American, the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Bowling Green State University under the mentorship of Kenneth Bergament. Uh, whose name is familiar to many of you, uh, I'm sure. And he completed a pre-doctoral internship and postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and McLean Hospital. Dr. Rosemary uh, studies the relevance of spirituality to mental health, and he innovates methods for clinicians to address this area of life. And Dr. Rosemary is also the author of the newly published book, uh, Thriving with Anxiety, Nine Tools to Make Your Anxiety Work for You. Uh, congratulations on your book release. Uh, this book just came out uh, last Tuesday, uh, so it's uh, freshly off the press. And we are also grateful to your generous offer. Uh, as you see on this slide, all attendees will receive a free 12-page guide uh, based on his new book. Um, and uh, the 20, first 25 people who claim their free guide will also get a free copy uh, of the ebook um, as well. And so you see the, uh, the, the link and the QR code on the slide. I'm also going to drop in the link in the chat for people to use that and, and click on it, and you can save the page uh, for your use. And this book is a practical guide to transforming our anxiety for a burden to a benefit, and it aims to change our relationship with anxiety. And through nine easy-to-follow strategies, Dr. Rosemary uh, demonstrates how to harness the power of anxiety to learn about ourselves, deepen our relationships with others, and achieve our deepest goals and dreams. So thank you again for your generous offer to the audience. And Andy, if you can go to the last uh, slide about uh, supporting Transforming Chaplaincy. Um, I also want to highlight on our ongoing fundraising campaign. 
uh, your support is uh, more critical than ever with more work to be done to elevate the field of chaplaincy through research and training. So if you find our webinars and resources available uh, and, and valuable to you, uh, consider supporting Transforming Chaplaincy. So um, with uh, wrapping up with all the introductions, I will uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Rosmarin, and thank you again for being here today. Thank you, I really appreciate that kind introduction. And um, I'm gonna show my screen. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. It's a real honor to speak for uh, Transforming Chaplaincy. I think at, we see uh, your presenter mode, so if you switch the screen. No, Sorry. Hold on. Just a minute. Oh, uh, that's why it was dark. All Boom. Right. How's that? We see that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Um, appreciate it. It's a real honor to speak for Transforming Chaplaincy and Rush University Medical Center. Um, your program is uh, doing incredible things to uh, transform and to advance chaplaincy. Um, in my neck of the woods, McLean Hospital is a psychiatric hospital, a uh, flagship uh, training facility of the Harvard Medical School in Psychiatry. And uh, myself as a clinical psychologist for about 14 years here, I've been uh, doing uh, scientific work um, and also clinical innovation to teach non-chaplain clinicians in how to um, assess for and address matters of spirituality. So um, I, uh, I think today I really wanted to go into the science of how to how is uh, spirituality relevant to mental health, um, and I do have some clinical directions, although I, I think these are really more specific to dealing with mental health uh, situations. Um, some of them um, are, are really intended for um, a broader audience than just chaplains, but I, I do think that um, they'll be uh, helpful nonetheless because they are based on the, the research that I'm about to present. So this type of work cannot be done without uh, a lot of people in your corner. And uh, uh, you know, as uh, as was mentioned during my introduction, I worked with Dr. Uh, um, Ken Pargament in as a graduate school uh, uh, mentor. And uh, ever since, in fact, he's coming tomorrow to give a grand rounds at, at McLean Hospital. So that's really wonderful. But he, um, they're really the better part of a hundred more, more than a hundred individuals in, who have been in my corner especially the Harvard Initiative on Spirituality, Religion, and Mental Health, which is a cross-Harvard initiative group of individuals um, who are really looking at different aspects of spirituality in this postmodern age. And whether that's in the context of public health or in medicine, or even in, uh, of course, the divinity school, but even in the business school, and really looking at the practical implications of taking spirituality to different areas of, of life. So um, I, I really enjoy the richness of that group and being able to explore my area of mental health within that context. I also want to mention my funding support is almost entirely philanthropic. Apparently, I'm not alone. Apparently, Transforming Chaplaincy has a similar, a similar setup. Um, and uh, that's sort of a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, it does give me a lot of academic freedom to be able to pursue what I want. On the other hand, um, there is limited funding for research on spirituality, and I think it's actually um, a shame, um, as we'll get into, because you're going to see that the mental health crisis today um, really needs a spiritual approach. And uh, this area is extremely common and also highly relevant, clinically relevant, to many of the things that people are, are presenting with to a variety of settings. So we will get to the science, and of course, we're gonna to get to some practice guidelines, but I did wanna start with an anecdote, and it's an interesting anecdote, I think, anyway, which is, in my first week as a pre-doctoral psychology intern, I, w I came to McLean Hospital uh, to, to study how to do intensive cognitive and dialectical behavior therapy with acute psychiatric patients. I was not here to study spirituality, I was not here um, in any uh, spiritual or religious capacity, still not, officially, um, but uh, that wasn't my goal from the outset. I was simply coming here as a trainee in the training program. And yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of the Orthodox Jewish faith and I, I you know, I uh, um, proudly wear my, my yarmulke to work, but a patient came over to me in the first week of being here. Let's, na let's name her just for argument's sake, we'll call her Brienne. And Brienne came to me in the middle of the day during the lunch hour, in fact, and she kind of comes over to me a little tentative and says, excuse me. And I said, yes. And she said, can I speak to you about God? So 
The problem is I was not the right address to talk to Brianne about God. Here I'm a lowly intern. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to have conversations with patients about the topic of spirituality and religion. That's not what I was there to do. I was learning how to do ostensibly secular therapy. But apparently Brianne thought that I was the right address by virtue of my own personal affiliation. So I said, you know, I, you should really speak to the chaplain. Later on that day, I found out that McLean Hospital had no chaplain. This is 14 years ago. We did not have a chaplain. Our chaplaincy was furloughed in the 80s because of budget cuts. We do today, but I'm, I'm skipping ahead in the story. The problem is that Brienne was not alone. Within the first six months of being at McLean Hospital, no less than 10 patients had come over to me and pretty much all had the same question. Um, excuse me, can I speak to you about God, spirituality, faith? Can you pray for me? That was another one. What else did they ask? Why is God doing this to me? Why am I so depressed? What does God want from me? That was one. Um, you know, essentially all of these patients were coming over to me and wanting to speak about their spiritual, their mental health in spiritual and not psychological terms. So eventually I went to my primary mentor who I knew was a, a very passionate atheist, in fact, and he's the director of Mac McLean Hospital's psychology training program. And I said to him, Dr. Bjorgvinson, this is what's been happening. What do you want me to do the next time a patient comes over and says, um, excuse me, do you, can I speak to you about God? And he leaned across the desk and he pointed his finger at me and I was convinced I'm gonna get fired. And uh, to his credit, that's not what happened. He said, many of our patients obviously have spiritual needs that we are not meeting. I'd like you to do research in this area, to identify what's going on, to quantify it, and to come up with solutions so that our clinical teams can actually address as opposed to ignore spiritual needs. And uh, serendipitously, I'll call it, you know, maybe the, the hand of God, um, during that fellowship, I did receive some philanthropic funding, which enabled me to do some research. And here are a couple of the findings that we had. I think they're, I'm telling, I'm sort of selecting individual papers as opposed to presenting everything. Because um, I'd like it to be clinically relevant. I want it to be relevant to the work that you do with the patients that, that you see. So our first step was to identify how relevant are basic aspects of spirituality to mental health. So Brianne came over to me and said, can I speak to you about God? How is her belief in God relevant to her depression? That was my question. And we had both positive and negative findings, which was in line with everything that Dr. Uh, that um, Dr. Ken Pargamon had taught me in grad school. On the positive side, our first study showed a clear benefit of belief in God. And we used the word G-O-D as a, if you pardon the pun, conservative measure of uh, spirituality, because had we used higher power or greater force, um, we could have done that, but we wanted to really have a very conservative, clear measure of, of people's belief. So we had a single item, to what extent do you believe in God? And the item's responses were not at all, slightly, fairly, moderately, or very. And in concert with patients' responses, this is over 250 patients in our sample, we had something very interesting. Patients who were attending our treatment program, to the extent that they believed in God, they had greater reductions in depression, greater increases in psychological well-being, and greater reductions in self-harm during a two-week course of treatment, the treatment itself was secular. The treatment had nothing to do with spirituality on the outside, anyways. Um, there was no spiritual content. There were no discussions about spirituality during the treatment. And there wasn't even chaplaincy, interesting, at the time. And what we found was patients with not at all or slightly belief fared worse than patients with moderate or very. And the standard deviation was about a half. So a moderate effect size in changes of depression and self-harm and psychological well-being. And then the question, the follow-up question, which was in the same paper, is why? What was it about belief in God that might have changed patients prospectively, given an advantage to certain patients over others? And the, the answer we came up with using a mediation analysis was that we evaluated a number of different proposed mediators, was that it wasn't about community support, and it wasn't about um, emotion regulation, but primarily it was that patients who had greater belief in God 
had greater belief in treatment. They were had greater expectancies of treatment that they would get something out of it, and they thought treatment was more credible. They were more likely to believe in you as a clinician if they had belief in something greater and something spiritual. In fact, only two subjects with no belief at all fell into the top quartile of expectancies and credibility of treatment. It is very hard in the throes of a psychiatric crisis to believe that you will get better, to believe that your treatment team can help you, to believe that the interventions that you're using are actually gonna get you somewhere unless people have some level of spiritual belief. In another study that we published, and this is more recent, much more recent in fact, this was among geriatric mood disorder patients. And also these are the, ben this is still positive. We're still talking about the positive benefits. Here, we didn't look only at belief in God, we looked at a bunch of different facets of essentially religion, whether it's affiliation or the importance of religion, how often people are attending services, how much do they believe in God, that one item, as well as their faith in God, to what extent do they think that God can help them, to what extent do they place their faith in something greater. And we tracked uh, older adults with mood disorders over a three-year period. So this is a prospective study, but a longitudinal one. They were followed every three to six months over three years, and we assessed for their spirituality at baseline, the different measures on your screen. And then we assessed for two things over time, their levels of depression, because these are mood disordered patients. And we also assessed for their levels of suicidality. How intense was their suicidality at any point in time? And what we found was very interesting. These mood disorders patients, their levels of spirituality, their levels of religion, spirituality were not associated with mood. Their depression did not co-vary with their levels of spirituality. Some patients with depression are religious. Some patients with depression are not religious. However, when it came to suicidality, the effect sizes were demonstrably large. If you look at the odds ratios, what you're seeing on your screen is that patients who had any level of spirituality were between a fifth, even, even more, and a third less likely to experience significant suicidality over the three-year period. And here too, we are seeing a benefit of spirituality where patients who have different facets of spirituality in their life and religion in their life, yes, they might experience depression, but in the throes of their depression, are they likely to want to give up and to feel that there's nothing they can do? I think these first two studies show, highlight empirically, the importance of spiritual and religious beliefs and practices for genu gen generating hope, generating connection, generating a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. And those factors, those factors impact the experience of treatment, they impact the course of severe symptoms like suicidality, and they can have a demonstrable effect on patients' mental health. Now, these are not in the general population. We're talking, about, we're talking about acute psychiatric patients and people who are already struggling. So that's also very significant here. You know, a lot of the research has been done in the general population where we might find people who are more religious are less likely to be depressed because they have community support. Now, these people are already depressed and we're still finding that the highest levels of distress and their treatment effects are moderated and affected by levels of spirituality. So I think that's important. Now, all of that is one, if you will, benefit that it creates more hope, more peace, more sense of connection. There's another theory though, that we recently evaluated in a paper, which is now in press and in personality and individual differences that I wanted to mention as an, as an example of a different, a different positive benefit of spirituality. The theory, which was put forth by Dr. Michael McCullough, a social psychologist, who at the time was at the University of Miami, um, and others have put forth this theory as well, who highlighted that spirituality is, is generally speaking associated with greater behavioral control, greater suppression of impulses. Now in the clinical literature, we find that spirituality is associated with lower levels of suicidality, that's Dr. Tyler Vanderweel's work, who you might be familiar with, um, from uh, the, uh, the Harvard Flourishing Program. It's been associated with lower levels of substance abuse, lower levels of alcohol abuse, and substantially so. It's also been associated, Dr. Harold Koenig's work, who's another mentor of mine actually, with greater uh, compliance with medical uh, directives, um, less, 
uh, less reactivity in terms of um, more regular behavioral patterns, less, less uh, uh, deaths of despair. And along those lines, though, we wanted to extend this line of work using a cognitive science experiment. Can we predict individuals cognitive responding to, an, to a decision-making paradigm using their spirituality as a proxy and their religion as a proxy? So we, we, we subjected patient, not patients, these are actually in the general population, to the sequential investment task, the SIT. And this is a sophisticated and quite a complex economic decision-making paradigm, which is being increasingly used within the field of computational psychiatry. And the idea here is to probe the effects of whatever variable on behavioral adaptation to positive and negative outcomes. I'll explain what that means. Patients, non-patients, sorry, people who do the SIT, people who do the sequential investment task are presented with a market. They are presented with uh, stock market um, investment tasks, investment decisions. And what happens is the market goes up and then we can see whether those individuals bet more or less reacting to the market going up. Then we see the market going down and we see do they bet more or less when the market goes down. The general trend of the market, do they react to it or do they have some sort of strategy that they stick to? And what we hypothesized was that different facets of spirituality and religion would be associated with greater, with less reactivity. That when individuals had higher gains or lower losses, they wouldn't bet more or less. They would simply stick to whatever they wanted. They would have more, if you will, behavioral control and cognitive control as opposed to being reactive and being pulled by different factors. Just to clarify here th about the theory, the, the idea is this, let's say somebody's considering whether to do something. So they might consider, is this in my best interest or is it not? Somebody from a religious standpoint would also consider, is this in line with my values or is it not? And that second layer of decision-making slows down the decision-making process and can buffer against impulsivity. So we were testing that out. Collectively in our study, facets of religion were significantly associated with task variables, suggesting that religious involvement, such as um, how important is religion to you, how often do you attend services, how, often, how much are you in, involved in religious community, how often do you pray, was associated with greater behavioral control, less reactivity to the markets. Spirituality though was not. How important is spirituality to you? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe in a greater force? So simply having those beliefs might enhance hope, meaning, purpose, um, kindness to others even, possibly, a, a sense of connectedness, 100%. But when it comes to the effects of impulsivity, when it comes to reactivity, when it comes to these aspects, religion seems to have very specific effects. All right, I mentioned before that spirituality is not all positive, and I can't emphasize this enough. In clinical populations, in clinical populations, we see something very pronounced called spiritual struggles or negative religious coping. Now, Ken Pargament was the one who came up with the term negative religious coping many years ago, before I was even a grad student. And uh, I think his first book, I think his book on psychology of religion and coping was 2001. I'm looking at it on my shelf. I don't see the, the, hour, the, the year on the spine. I think it was 2001. Might have even been 1997. It might have even been the, towards the end of, end of last millennium. In any event, what Ken identified is that people have struggles with their faith, and those have clear clinical implications. Struggles might include, why is God doing this to me? This is not fair. Um, struggles with other people in a religious context. Clergy sexual abuse, cler clergy abuse in general, um, for sure is a spiritual struggle or creates spiritual struggles. Some people look at themselves and they don't like what they see and they're actually uh, feel spiritually sullied. These types, of con these types of content in people's minds can really have a massive impact. And we've found consistently in patient populations that the, the, the these are, they're, they're not as common as the positive effects, but when they do occur, the effects are very pronounced. In this study, which is one of the first ones we published, in fact, on spiritual struggles, happens to be among psychotic patients, but we've repl replicated similar findings in other patient populations. 
spiritual struggles accounted for nearly 50% of the variance, our squared values for those statisticians in the audience, on the frequency and intensity of suicidal ideation at intake among patients. That's a very high level of correlation. And when patients are struggling with their faith, they often think there is no point. This is too much, I can't take it. The, the intensity gets really, really high, very high. And suicidality is something that can follow. Very interestingly, in this study that we published, similarly, spiritual struggles were associated with higher levels of depression, higher, even higher levels of mania, surprisingly, in this geriatric mood disorder patients. But was truly interesting, what was truly interesting was that struggles here, and we've seen this in a number of studies, were not higher among people who were religious versus non-religious. Non-religious individuals, people who affiliate with no faith at all, were equally likely to struggle with their faith. And the effect of those struggles was just as much, just as much as for individuals who do, who do associate with an affiliation. One of the explanations, which we've done through some qualitative work and also clinical work with our patients, is that many individuals leave faith, they leave the um, practices of religious faith because of their struggles, but they nevertheless hold on to the struggles. They're still asking, why is God doing this to me, even though they never pray anymore? So when we ask our patients, is there a religion you affiliate with, we actually miss out on a lot of the variants, on a lot of the puzzle, because many of them still struggle with their faith, and that's still relevant to their mental health. This is a study that we're still working on now, and uh, hopefully submitting a paper on this soon. We found that spiritual struggles were associated with greater connectivity within a region of the brain called the insula. And the insula is, is known to be more active in people with anxiety, but more importantly, the connectivity of the insular region means that it goes online or offline together. In other words, spiritual struggles seem to be associated with greater reactivity, greater emotional reactivity, or I should say they're associated with this biomarker of greater emotional reactivity. And this is just for your information among 32 older adults with the, and without mood disorders, in fact, a diverse sample, who are completing something called resting state functional magnetic resonance in their imaging. I wanna mention one more way in which spirituality is relevant to mental health. We've talked about the positive, we've talked about the negative, but there's another area that we've studied and done some clinical work on, and that's called spiritual symptoms. Now, spiritual symptoms are manifestations of mental disorders, which have prominent spiritual and religious themes. The two areas that are most common, that are most common are scrupulosity, and that's when OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder takes on religious themes. People become obsessed. Did I pray enough? Is something bad gonna happen because of something I did? Um, and uh, they might engage in excessive religious activities in order to ward that off, which are really OCD being masked by a cultural context of religion and also religious delusion. So we see this in psychosis and schizophrenia and other forms of psychosis where individuals such as probably the one on the screen are not only praying, they are actually being driven, if you will, by their religious delusions to engage in a religious behavior, to, uh, to take on a religious identity. We see this religious delusions of grandeur. Sometimes people will um, come to the hospital here and come to the Klein hospital and they will sign in that their name is Jesus or their name is Muhammad happens unfortunately and what that is really is a delusion which is being masked uh, taking on the form of uh, religion we also see it with hypomania people who are manic and hypomanic um, there are a couple of other ty types of uh, manifestations of this but those are, are definitely a minority now I published a couple of papers in this area but I think the most important is this it, you know for decades this was actually the most written topic on spirituality and mental health but I I think it's kind of ironic. It's, it's in some ways the least interesting of the three, the positive and the negative effects and the spiritual symptoms. But the reason why it was written about so much is because so many people in the field and people still to this day believe this, unfortunately, because it's not true, is that the spirituality causes the symptoms. That the reason people have OCD is because of their religion. The reason they're psychotic is because of their religious beliefs. And that does not seem to be the case from a scientific standpoint. There have been about 30, maybe 35, 40 papers that I've seen published on religion and OCD. 
I don't know a single one of them that shows that greater levels of religion are associated with higher levels of actual OCD symptoms. Same for psychosis. People who are religious are not more likely to be psychotic than people who are not religious. Furthermore, religious countries, by and large, if you look at places in the Middle East, they're not more likely to have, they don't have higher base rates of OCD. They don't have higher base rates of psychosis or of mania. They don't have higher base rates of any disorder, to my knowledge, compared to non-religious countries like Northern Europe. However, if you look at the levels of religious symptoms in religious countries, 80%, even 90% in certain countries of patients who come in with OCD, patients who come in with hallucinations or delusions have religious symptoms. In non-religious countries, 5%, maybe 10% of our patients. In America, 40 to 50% of our patients who have uh, these types of disorders, whether it's OCD or schizophrenia, have religious symptoms. So what's really going on here is that when religious individuals have symptoms of OCD, of mania, of schizophrenia, those symptoms are likely to be religious. It's not that the religion caused it, it's that the religion is a context for the expression of those symptoms. And it actually, I have seen many cases where patients themselves believe that their religion caused them to have OCD. Can you imagine the spiritual struggle that they are experiencing? Why did God do this to me? I'm trying to be a good fill in the blank. And it creates struggles, it decreases utilization of their resources, it fosters misunderstandings, it can make family discord, it can create all sorts of havoc. So one of the things I've really tried to push is when patients have spiritual symptoms, clinicians need to be very sensitive to, to, um, to um, highlighting this. I'll, and I'll get into this more at the end. Anyhow, these are the main effects of spirituality and religion, but in some ways, and I guess this is always the case, the most important findings that we've had are actually the simplest. How common is spirituality and religion among psychiatric patients? Now, this study was done in McLean Hospital. McLean Hospital is in Belmont, Massachusetts. There is hardly any enclave of the entire United States of America that is less religious than Eastern Massachusetts, <laughs> Belmont. Our catchment area is New Hampshire and, and Eastern Mass. Look at the levels of spirituality and religion among our patients. Interestingly, when we did this study, we did not say, do a come do a study about religion, because we knew that would bias the sample. We said, come do a research study. And then during informed consent, we told people what it was about. The numbers of patients praying once a week or more, 80%. Number of people with an, a, a, a level of belief in God, 70 plus, 60% affiliated. I never would have expected this, frankly. I thought it would have been half. Even more important, and this is extremely important for chaplaincy, and I mentioned today we do have a chaplain. We actually have a wonderful chaplain, not only a chaplain, but a chaplain educator and a clinical pastoral education program specializing in mental health chaplaincy. And that's led by my wonderful colleague, Reverend Angelica Zolfrank, who many of you might know. Anyhow, our patients want spiritual psychotherapy. Again, this is Eastern Massachusetts, where 60%, if you add it up, 58.2% of our patients want, have fairly moderately or very much interest in spiritual psychotherapy. I could not believe it. By the way, when I found these studies, these, these results, I could not believe it. These are not moderated by diagnosis. When I first presented these findings, people thought, oh, it must be the OCD patients, it must be the psychotic patients, and it's not. In logistic regression, those factors do not predict greater interest in spiritual psychotherapy. Age does not predict it. People thought maybe it's older adults. It's not. Younger individuals are just as likely to want spiritual treatment. To what extent do you want spirituality integrated into your care was our question. Across the lifespan, independent of diagnosis, and also largely independent of religious affiliation. This is the kicker. 37% of uninvolved, religiously uninvolved patients who have no religious affiliation themselves, nevertheless want spiritual psychotherapy. Fascinating. Now, this is what I'm up against as a mental health clinician and researcher doing spirituality research. 
this is the baseline. Now, granted, it's 2013. These studies, this this study was done, and things did change in 2020, 2021. Um, although we're seeing some uh, regression to the mean at this point. Um, typically, mental health clinicians stay away from the topic of spirituality and religion because they have never received training. They've never been taught what to do. And if you compare psychiatrists to any other medical doctor, you will find that they have higher levels of negative beliefs about spirituality, and they're also less likely to be religious. Psychiatrists are almost half as likely to have religious affiliation. A third is likely to, uh, two thirds is likely to believe in God, a third less likely to believe in God. Half is likely to believe in life after death, and half is likely to attend religious services. And the reason why is because this is the history of mental health. It's a pretty bad quote, especially the bottom one. I'll give you a second to read it. <laughs> These are a couple of well-known excerpts from Sigmund Freud's writings. <clears throat> Now, over time, these sentiments have shifted from antagonism, but there's still this belief that spirituality and religion should be checked at the door of the therapy room, and I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true. I think if you look at the numbers, let me go back to them over here. If you look at the numbers of patients for whom spirituality is relevant, personally, and the number of patients who want this, and the clinical relevance, which I've made clear in a number of ways, I don't think it makes sense for us to ignore this. So a couple of years ago, we got some in initial funding from uh, the Bridges Consortium, which is a project of the John Templeton Foundation. And we commenced a year long study, which had several stages called SPIRIT, which is an acronym for Spiritual Psychotherapy for Inpatient Residential and Intensive Treatment, S-P-I-R-I-T. And we published this as a psychotherapy tool in the <clears throat> American Journal of Psychotherapy. You can take a look at the DOI. In fact, it's on your screen. And if you pull the paper, which is now in open access, you will see in the index, sorry, in the appendix, in the appendix of that paper, the entire spirit protocol, which is a clinical protocol, which we developed for use, <clears throat> for use with diverse psychiatric patients in an intensive acute units. We followed up on the spirit project with um, a subsequent paper, which we published in psychiatric services. And Interestingly, predictors of patients' response or patients' benefit, perceived benefit from the spirit, was not affected, affected by demographic factors. Older versus younger patients were equally likely to benefit. SES, race, not significant. Clinical factors were not significant, whether it's depression or substance use and any other diagnoses. The substance use was a little uh, surprising because many people, in, you know, at least in the field of psychiatry, think that Spirituality is more relevant to people with substance and alcohol use because of Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs. But that does not seem to be the case. Patients with, um, in fact, patients with depression are more likely to want spiritual care than anybody else. But aside from that, there are no clinical factors. We also looked at severity of symptoms. How, how do initial severity of symptoms or people using um, electroconvulsive therapy or antipsychotic medications, these were not associated with greater or, be or worse response to spirit. It is the type of intervention that we have developed that has been provided. And you can see here, it's, it was provided to 1,443 self-referred patients. Interestingly, 40% of these patients had no religious affiliation. The largest group of patients to self-refer for spirit, which by the way, was delivered on 10 different clinical units by 22 clinicians, had no religious affiliation at all. It's a really fascinating thing how many people who are non-religious still want spiritual care and still benefit from it, um, irrespective of their symptoms, irrespective of their demographic factors, and irrespective of their religion. But this was the most surprising finding of all. Which clinicians, of those 22 clinicians who were stationed on different units providing treatment, what about them? Because we had nested data, we were able to look at the clinician factors, how that was associated with the effects of different aspects of patient factors in yielding those outcomes. And this was the most surprising finding of all. <clears throat> P 
patient's perceived benefit from spirit was higher among groups that were provided by clinicians who had no religious affiliation. The clinicians who had a religious affiliation, the effect sizes were uh, significant, statistically significantly smaller. Still high and still positive, but nevertheless smaller. Why? And by the way, it was not an interaction. So the the inter the the level of religion on the part of the clinicians does not interact with that of the patients because we did look at that. It was really more the way that religious individuals provide psychotherapy versus the way that non-religious individuals provide spiritual psychotherapy. Specifically. Religious individuals tend to take a very skills-based approach. This is the problem, this is the solution. What we call CBT, or cognitive behavior therapy. Unaffiliated clinicians tend to take a more DBT approach, dialectical behavior therapy. And what that means is that they respect both change and acceptance that we can't change right now. So the way that it's approached is these are some tools. However, we might or might not be ready to implement them, and that's okay. Let's simply get the tools on the table, and when you're ready, if you're ready, then you can use them, as opposed to this is what we need to do. And that approach in of itself seems to be much, very important for the delivery of spiritual care, where we're not even encouraging a specific practice. We're simply exposing people to different ideas that they can use when they are ready to do so. That's something that chaplains have known for a long time, but clinicians have to uh, do a lot of research in order to get there. All right, I'd like to shift a little bit with the little time we have left and talk about what are the clinical guidelines that emerge from these findings. When we're talking to patients about their mental health and whether that's a non-chaplain clinician doing so or a clinician doing so, how do we inform the practice through the research that I presented here today? So here are a couple suggestions. <clears throat> First is something you all do anyway, which is having an orientation or an informed consent process. And this is, hi, would you like to speak to me? I'm the chaplain. Or hi, would you like to speak about your spiritual life if you're not, not a chaplain? And as long as the patient says yes, then you can walk in the door and have the conversation. Um, beyond that, what, what I would recommend is we do something called a functional assessment. I realize that sounds very clinical, but bear with me for a minute. A functional assessment means how is the spirituality or religious factor that the patient is experiencing relevant to their clinical life? How is it clinically relevant to their depression, to their anxiety, to their psychosis, to their functional impairment, to their family life, to their sexual function, to whatever's going on, whatever they're experiencing, to their medical issue, to the compliance with the medical team? How is your spirituality relevant? Is it a resource? Is it something that helps you in some way and supports you? Is it a struggle? Is it an area of concern? Something that actually makes it harder for you to function in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety, in terms of impairment? Is it coloring the way in which your symptoms manifest? And from there, it, by the way, it could be multiple. And many times, in fact, it's both a resource and a, and a struggle. And many times if people have symptoms, it's all three. So that is a functional assessment. How is your spirituality relevant to your mental health? And to really understand, a, 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 have a crisp understanding of that question it, to inform the rest of the discussion. Now, what happens when patients have spiritual resources? So I met a patient recently who came uh, to one of our units and he was extremely and hopelessly depressed. And there was one thing going well for this individual which is that he had faith in something greater, but his treatment team was very reluctant to go there. I wasn't. I asked him, how does your spirituality relevant to your depression? He said, well, it makes me have a sense of hope, makes me have a sense of meaning, it gives me faith that things are gonna get better, it stops me from being suicidal. I'm like, okay, I've seen that before in my research. How can we use your spirituality to give you a boost now? He's like, I can do that? I said, sure. And we promoted it. We helped him to get access to Amazon and order a bunch of spiritual and religious books that were consistent with his faith. We, reconnect, we reconnected him with his pastor. We had him speak with his family about spiritual matters. We had him have a chaplaincy consult and had the chaplain come and meet with him and pray with him and do whatever 
you know, was indicated at that time. We had the, the clinical team and, su and supported them in encouraging this individual to have a more spiritual life. And this person left our program crediting the remission of his most severe depressive episode to the, to the integration of spirituality into his care. Now, what happens when patients have spiritual struggles? So this obviously, to some extent, depends on the case, but in another extent, it actually is a general concept. I'm gonna tell you about a patient I met. We're gonna call her Elizabeth Carmen. And the reason she was, the reason Elizabeth was sent my way is because she was uh, observed by one of the psychiatric nurses on her unit to be uh, saying, God hates me, God hates me, while talking to another patient. And the, the psychiatric nurse went over and said, is that something you'd like to talk about? And she buttoned up and no, I don't want to. And she said, no, 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 I heard what you said and I'd like you to meet with somebody. Anyhow, I was called in, this is before we had our chaplain. I was sort of, you know, pinch hitting, if you will, but, but more as a, as a non-chaplain clinician. And she opened up to me and she told me the following story. She said that she grew up Catholic, devout, she attended even catechism throughout all grade school into high school, and she drifted from her faith. And she married a man eventually who had zero interest in religion. And she became really ostensibly quite secular. And then she developed a pain disorder. She started having this unexplainable physical pain. And she was prescribed opiates, which were not helpful. She ended up addicted to opiates. Her anxiety went through the roof. When she got off of her opiates and her depression started to, run, to, started to rise very high. And she said to me, God hates me because I'm being punished for straying from my religious life. Now, then what happened was anytime she had some physical pain, that perspective made the pain worse because her tension increased. So she would tense up her muscles and from a mind body perspective, she was really suffering. So Elizabeth was normally a very reserved young woman and I just got her to open up about it. I didn't tell her whether God hates her, or God loves her, or you know, it's not my job. Maybe as a chaplain it would be, but that's beyond my pay grade. But I simply got her to talk about it. I just got her to open up and I did what Carl Rogers would have called um, supportive listening, um, uh, to be unconditionally positive, unconditional positive regard is probably what he would have called it. I didn't try to change her perspective. I didn't try to challenge her. I just sat with her so that Elizabeth wasn't alone. She was very tear filled. It was very hard for her, but I, the treatment provided enough holding that she was actually for the first time able to describe and to discuss her spiritual symptoms, which eventually she spoke to her husband about. Eventually she spoke to others about, and um, we're still in touch. She's, she's doing a lot better. Now, when it comes to spiritual symptoms, what do we do when patients come in with spiritual OCD or religious OCD, or religious psychosis? You know, the, I won't give you another patient story because we're running low on time, but I will tell you that it's so critical, mission critical, to tell these patients, your religion did not cause your symptoms. Rather, your symptoms would have had any, happened anyway. I tell my religiously OC, my scrupulosity patients, if you weren't religious, you'd have OCD anyway. But it wouldn't take a religious flavor. It would take a secular flavor. Instead of washing moral or spiritual impurity out of your hands, you'd be washing away some virus. It's just the presentation of the symptoms that's culture, context, culturally context, con, contextualized to the to the to the culture, as opposed to being caused by it. And that in of itself reduces spiritual struggles, helps to promote spiritual resources. You know, here's another point. Many clinicians are reluctant to encourage patients who are, have spiritual symptoms to engage in religion. And I understand that to some degree. If a patient comes in with religious psychosis, am I really gonna encourage them to pray? And I think the answer is yes, because when patients are involved in bona fide, value-based religion, that provides a contrast. It feels different internally than when psychosis is co-opting their levels of belief. And when they're able to bifurcate those, oh, I'm in psychosis mode, oh no, this is who I really am. That's helpful for all of treatment. Um, it's important for people to get it straight. Often when people are psychotic, they think that that's who they are. And that recognition of there's, this is where my identity ends and this is where my symptoms begin is really critical. I mentioned this before, but I'm gonna mention it again. 
that many patients will come in with two out of three of these effects or all three. I've had patients who had none and they still wanted to speak to spiritual care and I'm sure you've seen that as well. But in, in all of these cases, you know, I want to mention spiritual resources are positively correlated with spiritual struggles. The more resources people have, the more likely they are to struggle. The more they're likely to struggle, the more they're likely to have those resources. And the reason is, well, if you think about it, you know, an interpersonal relationship, who are you likely to have the biggest struggles with? Probably the people you love the most. And the same is true in the spiritual domain. When people have spirituality as a resource, they're also likely to struggle with that domain. The symptoms are more likely to occur when people have both, um, but not necessarily. However, when people do have the symptoms, they're very likely to struggle. And that's what the psychoeducation piece uh, gets at. Okay, I'm gonna have a couple concluding remarks here. Number one, this might surprise you, but this picture on your screen is uh, not a, a sports event. It's not a concert. It's not a cultural event of any sort. It is actually a mental health gathering. And it is a picture of the largest, most widely utilized mental health treatment in the world today. And it's not meditation or prayer, which might be used for mental health, but they're not treatments. This is a gathering of the 12 step Alcoholics Anonymous. And for those who are not aware, Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritually based treatment for alcohol abuse and misuse, which is accounts for more than 40%, more than 40% of recoveries in the United States. Now, if we know one thing about mental health today, it's that 50,000 people do not show up to our conventions. Many people are missing out on treatment because our field, the field of mental health, the combined disciplines, have eschewed matters of spirituality because of the lack of training and because of our history, as I presented beforehand. There is a critical disparity between the spiritual experience, the lived experience of patients and that of clinicians who do not see things the same way from a spiritual lens. I think the field selectively biased is selectively biased towards including people who are less religious. Um, I think there's even discrimination in the field against different forms of religion. I've certainly experienced that, although not here at McLean. I've been very blessed at McLean Hospital. I think this is an extremely inclusive and diverse uh, place, uh, inclusion, inclusive and respectful of diverse, of religious diversity. And uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, I have a book. My publicist made me put this slide in, you'll have to pardon me. But I did want to mention that this is the reason I wrote this book. That the publisher is HarperCollins and we're really swinging for the fences and trying to get the word out. And the goal here is that one third of the book speaks about the spiritual, if you will, benefits of anxiety and how anxiety is relevant to spirituality. But more importantly, this book was actually inspired by my interactions with chaplains. Because when people, uh, when clinicians, non-chaplain clinicians are dealing with mental health, usually it's, this is the problem and this is the solution. When chaplains deal with mental health, I have learned that there's much more sitting with the patient, sitting with the individual, just experiencing it, and then letting individuals, letting the person who's suffering find a path forward that could actually enhance their life. It's a much more organic process. And it also recognizes that the stress is part of the human condition. That is a message that I learned from my spiritual mentors and not from my clinical mentors, that anxiety and other forms of distress are part of life. So this is the new book, and I'm hoping um, that it'll resonate not only with uh, clinicians, but also with, um, with uh, the general public, given its spiritual focus. Um, for those who want to learn more information about my program and uh, the research that we are doing, that we have done, please check out spirit.mclean.harvard.edu. There is a contact form. You're welcome to reach out. And I thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak with you here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, the wonderful presentation. And I, and I loved how, you know, integrating clinical evidence and, uh, and, and cases and practical recommendations. Uh, thank you for, for providing this wealth of, of information and, and clinical mm -hmm. guidelines. Uh, we have a few audience questions. If we have a few minutes for, yep. uh, somebody in the audience is asking, would, um, would spirit be applicable to pediatric psychiatric treatment settings? 
and what resources are you aware similar resources that are relevant to pediatric mental health and spirituality and religiosity yes great question um, in theory uh, pediatrics and especially adolescents I do think spirituality is something that's relevant. I think it's often missing from the education system, let alone the clinical system. However, there are a lot of, um, I found that adolescent clinicians who are meeting with, sorry, clinicians who specialize in providing care to adolescents tend to be very protective of those. And they should, for, for good reason, for very good reason. But when it comes to integrating spirituality and religion, often, at least in a mental health setting, we seen some pushback um, and there's a sometimes a cultural divide there if you happen to be in a setting where the chaplain is welcome into adolescent units and pediatric units i think there's a lot of work that can be done i do think spirit could be easily adapted to those settings um, we actually have now an electronic version of spirit a, an app version called digital soul which is actually it's very cute you can see it on our website um, and there are these uh you know, really uh, cute little uh, uh, characters in it, and, and it, it's almost uh, you know designed in some ways for for, for younger for younger folks. Um, so I'm optimistic, but at the same time, you know, there is a culture that I think has to shift, um, and that's been in some ways the primary barrier to be to be to be frank. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question um, is about kind of clarifying: Is spirit something a chaplain can lead, administer? Right. Um, and if not, suggestions for encouraging psychiatry or other clinicians to utilize it, this yep. approach. Yeah, we do have chaplains who are leading spirit groups. Um, I think chaplains have a, a, a broader range of, uh, of spiritual repertoire or, or spiritual resources that can be used, sometimes which, uh, which, which does dwarf anything that we could have included in spirit. Spirit is really intended for non-chaplain clinicians who, who want to get some basic guidelines. It's almost like a clinician who has no training in how to have spiritual care, how can we get this super simple that they can deliver with a, an array of different patients on an array of different settings in acute psychiatry? But with that said, you know, chaplains can certainly use it as a starting point for, and we do, we have done that at McLean Hospital. In fact, a lot of our spirit groups have been provided, um, not as much in the new study that we're doing, but, but we, we certainly encourage it. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to get your feedback on the protocol if you take a look at it, whoever asked that question and others as well. Yeah. So the protocol, you mentioned one of the publications that it's uh, available in the um, supplemental materials, right? So There it is. Yeah, it should be uh, available online with a couple of clicks. So it's okay. uh, we, we negotiated that with the American Psychiatric Association when we published the paper with them, in fact, because we really wanted to make this open access and mm -hmm. give it to the world as a, to promote spiritual care. Thank you. Um, um, another um, uh, um, attendee is asking, I am starting a spiritual care groups with those in the community struggling with mental illness. What topics do you recommend for our groups? I wonder if that connects back to uh, looking at the spirit uh, template or other, other topics yeah, that would you I think I think the spirit uh, protocol would be a good place to start. And you can see there are seven different handouts. Um, one or two of them deal with the positive side, or a couple of them deal with the negative side, as you might have expected. Uh, we don't have one specific to symptoms because that sort of just usually comes up, um, and it's not usually relevant to the entire group of patients. I should mention, spirit is done in a group setting. It's always done in a group. It's not one-on-one. -on -one. So depending on the format, you might want to adjust um, uh, that uh, that way. Um, yeah, I would take a look at Spirit as a, as a starting point, um, and uh, I'm sure you're training in chaplaincy. You're probably better better able to answer that question than I ever will be. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, and um, the next question, um, somebody's asking, I have avoided visiting patients in our behavioral health units who are labeled as religiously preoccupied. I have thought I should wait until the psychosis has passed and see them later. Do you recommend engaging with them during the psychotic period manifesting? I do not itself? agree. I think that it's actually very important for patients, as and I'll reiterate what I said during the talk. Yeah. When somebody's having psychosis, there's two factors. There's the severity of the psychosis, and then there's how much do I believe that this is me? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a person could be having a delusion, but they they recognize they're like, 
that's psychosis. That's not me. Now, that is called insight. We call that insight. And insight is one of the most critical factors that, that can shape the course of psychosis over time. So if a patient can say, this is my religion and this is my psychosis, and bifurcate those two into Venn diagrams, sort of instead of having them entangled, to separate them out and say, this is my psychosis and this is who I really am, that could be a big benefit. Now, the one caveat I have is, what's the clinical culture on your unit? Because if you're going to walk in, they're going to be like, oh, no, he's psychotic. Don't do it. That happened to me at first. They, you know, but but I but I I worked with the head of our psychotic disorders program, and I did research on the subject, and we tested it, we evaluated. You know, spirit is used by people with active psychosis all the time. Hmm. We use it on the psychotic disorders units, and we've never had an ad, an, an adverse event. Not once have we ever had an adverse event. So I am bullish on that. I'm very positive on it, and the use of spiritual interventions, even with actively psychotic patients, even with religious symptoms. But you have to. You know, you have to explain how and why you're going to do that to your colleagues, yeah. um, and uh, we have to recognize that that there might be some pushback. Yeah. Thank you for that really practical uh, guidance around that question. And just one last question: It's I know it's hard to answer is in a in a few minutes or one minute. Has your work, but it's an important question, kind of looking forward. Has your work impacted relationships and reviews from funding sources in a manner that demonstrates greater optimism from spiritual care, like in terms of the research funding, clinical uh. funding, more? Dissemination. What's the hold? Yeah. What does the future hold for spiritual care? I don't know. Yeah. I would like to think that we have a more open spiritual zeitgeist since 2020. I have seen some more positive uh, indications in the last little while. I also think there's there's an increase in, in philanthropy in general. Mm -hmm. There's Oh, you know what? I'll give you one ray of hope. I'll give you another ray of hope. And then with this, we'll conclude. Yeah. You should please look up, and this is interesting, the National Institutes of Health has a cross-institute special interest group, SIG, on spirituality, religion, and health. And it's being um, shepherded by some folks at the NIAAA, the National Institute of Alcohol and Alcoholism, uh, Alcohol Abuse. And uh, they are, uh, but there is a movement now, even within NIH. What will happen as a result of it? Who knows? Will it lead to funding? Will it not lead to funding? Will there be greater recognition? You know, I will tell you that I think with the mental health crisis, it's really calling for it in our society at a fundamental level for clinicians to, to, to get past their, our secular biases and to look at what our patients really want and really need. Will that translate into science in the future and funding dollars? God only knows. God only knows. I appreciate your willingness to go over a few minutes answering these great questions, no and uh, thank you for spending this time with us, and I hope it's uh, uh, part of an ongoing conversation with uh, chaplains and non-chaplain -clinician, non clinicians around spirituality and mental health. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.